It kind of blows my mind to consider the fact that we're up to nearly 600 episodes of this podcast, the 10% Happier Podcast. That's a lot of conversations. I, I like to think of it as a great compendium of, and I know this is a bit of a grandiose term, but wisdom. The only downside of having this vast library of audio is that it can be hard to know where to start. So we're launching a new feature here, playlists. Just like you put together a playlist of your favorite songs. Back in the day, we used to call those mixtapes. Just like you do that with music, you can do it with podcasts. So if you're looking for episodes about anxiety, we've got a playlist of all of our anxiety episodes. Or if you're looking for how to sleep better, we've got a playlist for that. We've even put together a playlist of some of my personal favorite episodes. That was a hard list to make. Check out our playlists at 10percent.com slash playlist. That's 10%, all one word spelled out, dot com slash playlist, singular. Let us know what you think. We're always open to tweaking how we do things, and maybe there's a playlist we haven't thought of. Hit me up on Twitter or submit a comment through the website. From ABC, this is the 10% Happier Podcast. I'm Dan Harris. My guest this time, we're doing a little bit of an experiment. The guests uh, are in Missoula, Montana. This is the first time we're actually doing uh, an interview remotely. Uh, these guys are known as The Minimalists. You might have heard of them. They have a very popular podcast. They also have a documentary called Minimalism, a documentary about the important things. Uh, their names are Joshua Fields Milburn and Ryan Nicodemus. These guys grew up together. Uh, they were living a, uh, uh, a very sort of typical American life filled with a lot of striving and sort of career ambition, which uh, I can certainly relate to and um, uh, I'm sure a lot of you can relate to. And then they made a very radical decision. Uh, and part of that, of course, was uh, given that we're having them on this podcast, part of that, of course, involves some uh, meditation. So uh, without further ado, here they are. Gentlemen, thanks for doing this. Absolutely. Thanks for having us. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. So just so uh, the listeners can differentiate between your, your respective voices, can you introduce uh, yourselves? Josh, you, you go first. Give, give me your name and your favorite food. <laughs> hey, I'm Joshua Fields Milburn, and of course my favorite food is guacamole. <laughs> Strong. I agree. Yeah. My name is Ryan Nicodemus, and my favorite food is uh, Masaman curry, hands down. Masaman curry. Yeah, man. I don't even know if I could pick. Dishes. I don't even know if I could pick that out of a lineup, but I feel like I'm like somewhat culinarily literate. Masa it's a, it's a Thai dish. Yeah, ch you should check it out, man. If you're next time you're at a Thai restaurant, well, let's get down to the uh, as you guys like to say important things. There's a lot of I want to talk about uh, your documentary and and minimalism and uh, your lives now, all that stuff. But let since this is at least ostensibly a meditation podcast, let's just start there. So, how did each of you? come to meditation and what does it do for you so let me start with you let's go ryan well you know for me we we actually wrote about this in our book uh, everything that remains we talk about this 20 minutes of awesome so for me like this was a really was a really good approach uh to, to kind of start with meditation where you know i literally would just take 20 minutes a day and kind of sit and let my mind wander like, let how, it have all how did the idea even come to you like, well, why, why did you even start doing 20 Minutes of Awesome? It was actually through a friend. Uh, his name is Colin Wright. He's got a, he's got a whole minimalist blog himself called ExileLifestyle.com. Um, and, and, yeah, he, uh, he's the one that actually introduced me to it. Because, you know, I was, like a lot of people, just kind of skeptical with, with meditation and it being too woo-woo and having to, you know, have some type of uh, spiritual practice uh, related with it. And, and Colin introduced me to this 20 Minutes of Awesome, and uh, and, and I kind of took to that. That seemed like a, a practical approach. I rudely interrupted you when you were actually describing what the 20 Minutes of Awesome was. So, A, let me apologize, and B, <laughs> carry on and tell us what it actually is. Oh, no worries. So, you know, f 20 Minutes of Awesome is basically just taking 20 minutes to allow your thoughts to just roll and to not judge any thoughts that you have. But to really kind of uh, just sit there and let your your brain express itself as much as as much as it wants to, and and ultimately what I found is by kind of letting those thoughts roll, you know, eventually it I would feel this calm and I would feel uh, a bit of a bit of a quietness after letting it, it roll for for ten or fifteen minutes, 
And and uh, what does the, the, what this does for me? It just kind of helps me reset, especially like if I'm feeling a lot of anxiety, if I'm you know stressing out over an interview or uh, or or a book tour stop or whatever it may be. Uh, it was just a way to kind of help me to to regain a little bit of control over over my thoughts. So let me press you on this just a little bit because to my I, I'm this may expose me as some sort of meditation um, you know Stalinist here, but. Um, uh, <laughs> You know, I, I just personally, because my mind is so irretrievably uh, disorganized, um, I needed some structure. So, like, it, the structure didn't have to be a lot, but it was, at least at the beginning, you know, pay full attention to the feeling of your breath coming in and going out. And then every time you get lost, start again. And when you get mm-hmm. lost, you know, when you get distracted, don't judge the thoughts that are coming up. Just make a, a little note of them and then start again. Do you feel like um, not having that structure was okay for you? And and how do you sit and just watch your thoughts non judgmentally without getting caught up in them? You know, if like how how do you not get caught up in the planning or worrying or whatever else comes up when you sit? Typically, if I start to get caught in the weeds with a thought, uh, that is when you know I would uh, draw my attention back to my breath. There's this. Um, I think it's like a Tai Chi breath where you focus in on bringing in breath to your stomach, then to your chest, and then out through your chest, and then out through your stomach. And it kind of helps me to to kind of uh, rein it in a little bit. But but what I have found uh, from practicing that 20 minutes of awesome is, is now I will typically, before I go into the practice, I will think about, okay, what, what do I want to accomplish today and because that's usually when I meditate is in the mornings and um, you know for example uh, if I have a mentoring client or if I got a bunch of mentoring clients that I'm going to talk with you know I will I will sit there and think to myself okay I want to be a really good teacher today today I want to be a teacher so what I've gone from you know kind of letting those thoughts wandering and and uh, uh, trying not to get you know caught too much in the weeds now I kind of develop this a, you know, a little bit of a mantra, I guess, where on my in breath, I will think to myself, today I will, and then on the exhale, be a teacher. And it's not like I'm actually, you know, saying that loudly in my head. It's more of a, you know, more like a whisper, if anything. But it does help me to to focus on, on what I want to accomplish that day. And it helps me to kind of uh, keep a steady line of, of, of consciousness going without it getting too out of hand. It's funny just listening to you because I realized that I'm, I must be like a rule follower um, mm. <laughs> because I, I wanted to know, especially when I began, and, and to this day, when I started meditating and to this day, I wanted to know and I still want to know that I'm doing it right. But you, uh, whatever that means, you know, and that's a yeah. whole that's a whole discussion we can have. But you, sir, you're just like you you came up with a bespoke model for yourself, and you're just going with it. And you sound at least uh, um, what's coming through uh, in your voice is that it sounds like it's working for you, and you're pretty confident about it. Yeah, it, I mean, it works really well. I, I am not a rule follower. Uh, Josh will <laughs> probably be the first to tell you that. But you know, for me, doing it right means that. Uh, I'm feeling better or it's, you know, it's, it's adding value somehow to, to my daily, to my daily routine or my daily process or whatever. And, ha- and, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I, go ahead. Go oh, ahead. no, I was going to say, you know, I was going to say, I, I, I am open to, um, you know, mindful meditation. In fact, um, you know, I'm kind of going through your, your week intro right now. I'm on like day two or three. Oh, on the uh, it, 10% happier app. thing. Yeah. Yeah. On the 10% happier app. And, uh, and it, it has, I, I can see benefits from it, um, over, you know, just using that the last few days. So that is something that, you know, I am flirting with right now. Um, but you know, I don't claim to be an expert at, <laughs> at meditation and, you know, um, my, the strategy that I, that I currently use now, uh, won't necessarily help every single person listening uh, to this, but but I think what it has done for me, going from the twenty minutes of awesome to kind of developing this this very simple mantra, uh, it has helped me to get into maybe more uh, a more mindful meditation practice. Uh, all really co- interesting, cool, and thank you for the the plug and trying the thing out. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, so, J- Josh, let me t- torture you for a second. Um, what, what is? Do you have a daily practice, and if so, what is it, and how how did you start? I also am a rule follower, although 
the problem with me is I, I never know which rules to follow. Yes, especially in this area, right? Because yeah, H- have you tried uh, transcendental meditation at all? Uh, yeah. You know, um, we're, I'm going to get taught um, how to do transcendental meditation from this guy Bob Roth over at the uh, uh, David Lynch Foundation. So I've d- I've done tiny, tiny amount of um, mantra meditation, but I'm. Um, and I feel guilty about not being able to talk about it with authority, so I'm going to go learn how to do it so I can say something without being a complete ignoramus. That's kind of how I feel, although I also feel like I shouldn't have to be taught how to how to do it as well. And so I'm sort of in, in a weird, weird You space. feel that way about, like, you know, operating heavy machinery, um, uh, you know. <laughs> Brain like, surgery. Yes. I mean, like, what's wrong with pedagogy? Yeah, well, I, I'm somewhat of an autodidact. I, I don't know if it's just been, like, anti-authoritarian i never did the whole college thing so you're not a rule follower well i I like following my own rules i I see establishing uh, really sort of uh um, abstruse uh systems of 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 rules for myself I, i like to build walls that i then have to climb over i suppose um but yes i i i do have a daily practice but i always thought i kind of hated the idea of meditation i thought it was just to be frank stupid and then I read this book called Ten Percent Happier. Uh-huh. And, and and I know that sounds like, flattery uh, will get you nowhere. Well, that's well, actually that, that, that's not true. <laughs> here's the thing: I I had a lot of friends who meditated and expressed the benefits, but it seemed very, uh, uh, just it seemed odd to me. And I, I was very much in the corporate world. You know, Ryan and I, throughout our our lotus eating twenties, we we sort of climbed the corporate ladder together. We both grew up really poor. And then figured out the key to happiness was, of course, to make more money. And and so we spent our 20s working 60, 70, 80 hours a week and, and stressing ourselves out. Uh, by age 27, I was the youngest director in, in my company's 140-year history. And instead of happiness, I had a lot of anxiety and stress and discontent, and not to mention you know, debt, which then added to the stress, anxiety, and discontent. And, and it was this vicious cycle that just kept going. And and I stumbled across this thing called minimalism and simplified my the, at least the the external clutter in my life, but I I found that by dealing with that I was able to start looking inward and dealing with some of the internal clutter, and, and as I started dealing with with the internal clutter, eventually I, I did stumble across your book thanks to Sam Harris, and and we yeah. I started. I started you know, incorporating just a daily practice into my life um, with Sam Harris's um, daily. You know, he, he sort of had this guided meditation up on his website that that made sense to me because it wasn't it, it wasn't woo woo. But your story really resonated with me because, you know, uh, like me, you were sort of this you know this regular suit and tie guy who who, who didn't want to go live the rest of his life in a cave and, and be an ascetic. And eschew the worldly experiences, but you wanted to have a, a a practice that allowed you to to I guess deal with that with that internal clutter. And and so yeah, for me it was it was just following you know, basic mindfulness meditation in the mornings. And it started out doing it five minutes a day. And I I used uh, an app called Headspace originally, and and that was a great way to to sort of have an introduction in into that world. And and then I just built up to 10, 20 minutes a day. And I'm, I'm doing about 25 minutes a day right now. In fact, uh, mine's a little bit different now. I've been doing a daily practice in a, in a sauna, uh, in a dry sauna. So uh, I'm in a dry sauna for 25 minutes a day, and, and I do meditation while, while I'm in there. All right, I want to ask you about that and about what, what kind of impact it's having on your life. But let me just uh, amplify a few or, or, or talk about a few of the um, – uh, things that you mentioned in in the in the uh, foregoing paragraph, um, uh, Sam Harris. Just for the uninitiated, he's a friend of mine. He's also one of the, um, I guess, uh, leading atheists in America. He made his name uh, uh, railing against organized religion, but uh, very interesting. On the side, he uh, not on the side really, but actually, well preceding his uh, becoming a famous atheist, he. 
uh, had a very deep and and longstanding uh, uh, meditation practice, and he then wrote a book about that get, got into some of that and also some of the brain science. He went off and, and became a neuroscientist as well, so he writes about it with real authority, both as a meditator and as a scientist, uh, called Waking Up, which is a phenomenal book. I recommend it heartily to everybody. He's also got a podcast called Waking Up that I also recommend to everybody, and um, he posts guided meditations. In fact, he's going to be coming out with an app uh, to teach people how to do meditation, which I suspect will be amazing, and his guided meditations are amazing. Uh, and then you also mentioned Headspace, which is also amazing. I say this even though um, you know I, too, am, am in the meditation app game, but the, the but Headspace is definitely the industry leader, the first mover, and, and uh, I know a lot of people who've derived a lot of benefit from it. Um, so anyway, having uh, uh, cleared my throat on all that stuff, tell me about the sauna meditation and, and 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 what kind of impact has meditation generally had on you? Are you less of a jerk, more of a jerk, neither? <laughs> I think you'd have to ask the people around me whether I'm, I'm less uh, of a jerk. Or, I, I, I can tell you this. People around me, once, once I started clearing that internal clutter, uh, people at, at work started saying things like, you know, there were people that work around me started saying things that like you, you seem less stressed, you seem so much calmer, you seem nicer. What the hell's going on with you? Um, but I, I think it was subtle. It wasn't like there was this you know, dramatic 180 degree change. It was it was pivoting. And so I think if you pivot five, ten degrees in one direction, it doesn't seem like much at the time. But a year from now, two years from now, five years from now, you're in an utterly different location. Yeah, I think that's true. So what is the sauna meditation? Well, yeah, I, I, I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty simple. I, I sit in a sauna for 25 minutes and, and focus on my breath. And, and it's just a, a very basic mindfulness uh, meditation. It, it started out with, with uh, Sam Harris's guided meditations, which are, are, are free. I'm pretty sure you can find them at his website. And, and it was just guiding you through that process of, of focusing on you know, the sensation in, in your body and what you're feeling and, and, and your breath. And, and letting go not just of 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 the thoughts but but letting those sensations pass and realizing you know it's just occurring to you and so so that that that's why meditation i'll I'll tell you that in the sauna it adds an extra layer because you know it's 180 degrees in there so it it gets quite hot so you're noticing some other sensations in, in your body as well and obviously you're sweating so you have you have more things to notice i don't know that i would have started out that way but the uh, th- I mean, there's a bunch of, of benefits for being in a sauna, having a, a practice, you know, scientific benefits. Uh, I'm not sure, f- sure if you're familiar with uh, Doctor R- Doctor Rhonda Patrick, but she no. uh, she she's written quite a bit about some of the studies of of you know the benefits of of being in a sauna, and and so I figured, well, if I'm going to be in there for 25 minutes a day, it's the perfect time for me to do to do my uh, my mindfulness practice as well. Interesting. Um, so you mentioned Sam Harris's website. It's samharris.org for anybody who's interested in checking it out. Um, so you said something else, Josh, and I want to get both of you guys talking about this, about your personal relationship and the nature of your backgrounds and what brought you to minimalism and what minimalism is. Um, uh, you know, in, in your documentary, which is, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but Minimalism, a documentary about the important things. Am I saying that correctly? That is correct. Okay. So in your documentary, um, you talk quite movingly about about your childhood. Uh, but you had very similar childhoods and were friends since childhood. Can you, can you just tell, me, tell us a little bit about that? And you guys can hold forth in whatever order you would like. Sure. R- Ryan and I are both 35 now, and we've known each other you know, for the better part of 25 years, so since we were fat little fifth graders. And, uh, you guys were day, fat? <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> uh, we, we were the two fattest kids in school. It was unbelievable. Where, uh, where, where think, was this? This is Dayton, Ohio. Dayton, Ohio, okay. Yeah, so we, we sort of bonded over uh, cheese fries and cheeseburgers and anything with cheese. And, and <laughs> uh, you know, we, we, we both grew up poor on, on separate sides of town, but on there was a, there was. You know, government assistance and food stamps, and Ryan lived in a. It was almost cliche, like trailer park, and 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 growing up, we were pretty discontented. And and I remember there was this conversation that Ryan and I had in high school. We were we were sitting at the at the lunch table, and he figured out that we could be happy if we could just make fifty thousand dollars a year. 
like this was the equation be, because you know, neither one of our parents had, had ever made that, and we assumed that the discontent was was there because we just weren't making enough money. And while it's true that that you know, money can can certainly help amplify an experience, I, I found that by by making the same decisions that our parents made, it, uh, money allowed uh, uh, amplified. Uh, amplified our experience in a different way throughout our 20s you know so instead of going to the traditional college route or, or whatever i went out and got a sales job when i turned 18 and and realized pretty soon i could make fifty thousand dollars a year uh except by age 19 i was spending sixty five thousand mm-hmm. dollars a year so i started experiencing debt for the first time in my life and i was always spending toward that next paycheck or that next promotion and, and by my mid twenties, although I was ostensibly successful, I'd climbed the corporate ladder. I had massive amounts of debt, and I was overweight. I weighed eighty pounds more than I weigh now, and, and I certainly wasn't happy. I, I was successful, but only in a very narrow sense, sort of monetarily or, or status-wise. Right? I had an impressive job title, which which is problematic because it's one of the first things we do when we when we meet someone. We ask them, "What do you do?" And and I had an impressive answer to that. You know, I'm the director of operations for 150 retail stores, but but I didn't feel a sense of fulfillment or purpose or joy from from what I was doing with my life. And, and instead, I felt all these these negative feelings. And then uh, in in 2009, uh, my my mother died and my marriage ended both in the same month. And and these two events sort of forced me to to look around and, and start to question what had become my life's focus. And what I realized is that I was so focused on on so-called success and, and achievement, and especially uh, on the accumulation of stuff. You know, sort of these these trophies of success, these trinkets. And uh, I had lost sight of what was important in my life. I, I didn't know what was important anymore. And and so I stumbled across this thing called called minimalism, um, and found a whole community of people who were sort of jettisoning their, their material possessions so they could start to focus on, on what was important. And there were a bunch of different people. It, it didn't necessarily apply to just uh, you know, a single white guy from a middle-income family who, who I first stumbled across, a guy named Colin Wright, who's, who's also in the film. Uh, but there were minimalist families, a guy named Leo Babalta, and he has six kids and a wife, and they live in San Francisco, and, and they're this whole minimalist family, and they were minimalist entrepreneurs and minimalist architecture, and, and how, how did these things overlap? And, and so I started sort of letting go of, of my stuff, and over the course of about eight, eight or nine months, I, I let go of about 90% of my material possessions, although I, I think if... You visit my home today, you probably don't walk in and say, oh, my God, this guy's a minimalist. You, you just walk in and say, wow, it's really, really freaking tidy in here. And, and it's because I don't own much, but everything I, I do own serves a purpose or, or brings me joy, and, and everything else is out of the way. And, and by, by letting go of that, that stuff, that external stuff, I was able to start looking inward and, and say, okay, what's, what's going on inside? Who's the person I want to become? How am I going to define my own success and, and why have I been so discontented by this stuff? And what will make me content in the long run? Oh, I have a million questions, but I want to. <laughs> I want. I want to let Ryan. I want to let Ryan tell his story uh, as well. So, uh, Ryan, you yeah. want to take me back to the overweight, uh, cheese eating kid who thought yes. fifty grand was going to solve all his problems? <laughs> it all started my uh, first day of fifth grade in, in Dayton, Ohio. No, yeah, I, I uh, met Josh. Like he said, we were fat little fifth graders, and. You know, I just, all I noticed was like, there was a kid that was fatter than me and I was like, sweet, like me and this kid, we're going to get along. And and we did like, we, yeah, we hit it off right away. Um, but yeah, kind of, you know, just to recap what Josh was saying, uh, it was, it was a struggle growing up. And I remember you know, money always being a, a source of discontent. Um, and I'm sure a lot of people experience that. So, you know, I didn't know what I wanted to do when I got out of high school. All I knew is that I didn't want to experience the same problems. So, uh, I was one summer I was working for my dad. Um, he paints and uh, hangs wallpaper and, uh, we were in this like pretty, pretty nice home and it looked like something that I could afford if I really, you know, put my mind to it, just like a, you know, Midwestern middle-class home. And I asked my dad like, Hey dad, how much, how much do I need to make to have a house like this? And he's like, son, 
if you can make fifty thousand dollars a year, you could probably have a house like this. So that that is where that equation came from, the fifty thousand dollars equal, equaling happiness. Because you know, I thought having a house like that uh, it, it would make me happy. Um, the the pictures of the families on the wall, they seemed like they were really really happy. When I met the homeowners, they seemed really happy and. You know, I thought it was because they didn't have the the same amount of money problems as as what uh, you know I I grew up experiencing. So that is that's where you know I kind of set the bar, and I eventually went to go work with Josh uh, just in a uh, telecommunications uh, company, and and I started climbing the corporate ladder with with Josh. I uh, you know ostensibly was really really successful. Um, but like Josh, I was working 60, 70, sometimes 80 hours a week. And I was, I was forsaking some of the most important aspects of my life. I mean, I hardly thought about my health or my relationships or, you know, God forbid things that I was passionate about. I mean, the, the work was my passion, you know? And, uh, yeah, I did drugs a lot. I drank a lot. Uh, I was just using as many pacifiers as I could. And yeah, it got to a point where, um, I just didn't know what was important anymore. But, you know, as this is kind of going on with me, Josh is dealing with his his uh, own stuff with his mother passing away and his marriage ending both in the same month. And I'm watching him go through this. And, you know, as the months go on, um, yeah, I started noticing like small stuff with Josh, right? Like I went to his house and um, well, his his apartment um, when he first move out, moved um, out of his home with his wife and moved into his, his new place. I remember going in there and there was this bracket for a TV on the wall. Like it came with the place. It was like, you know, the perfect spot to put a TV. And I remember looking at that thinking, Oh man, like Josh is going to get an awesome TV that goes up there. Cause for some, like that was one thing for some reason, him and I always compared each other. Like we always compared ourselves to, it was like, who's got the better TV, who has the most TVs. So, uh, so I asked Josh like, Hey man, like this is a really nice TV bracket. What are you, what kind of TV are you going to get, man? You're going to get one of those like, you know, big, uh, HDMI, I think, or HDMI, whatever, whatever the latest technology was. That's my fault for using jargon there. I have no idea what I'm talking about when it comes to technology. Um, but, but yeah, he, uh, he was like, you know, I don't, I don't know. I don't know if I'm going to get a TV. Maybe, maybe not. And as the months went on. Uh, he, he didn't get a TV and I was like, Oh, that's weird. But you know, no big deal. He's just, you know, doing his own thing. And, uh, then I noticed things like, um, our boss would call him at ridiculous hours, which that's what he did with all his employees. That's, I mean, that, that's how the, uh, the corporate structure was set up there. We, you know, we're answering our phones until midnight and we were waking up at five or 6 AM getting to emails and returning phone calls. And, uh, I got to a point where, you know, I think it was like Christmas Eve and, uh, Josh is our, our boss, like calls Josh and Josh answers his phone and, uh, he's like, uh, hello, can I help you? And, uh, our boss is like, yeah, um, uh, I need a sales update. Like wh- where are your numbers right now? And Josh was like, I don't know. And he's like, what do you mean? You don't know what are the numbers? I mean, you're, you're supposed to be close to this. You're not close enough to your people. And, and you just kind of let him go. And then Josh was like, you know, what you're asking right now is unreasonable. It's it's uh, you know six p.m. on Christmas Eve. I'm out having dinner with friends, and uh, you'll get the report um, at the end of the day. And uh, that that was probably like my first uh, real uh, cue to like, oh my god, like something different is going on with Josh. Like, what the heck is going on? So um, eventually, I. After noticing just, you know, these things here and there, I invited him out um, to a really, really nice restaurant for lunch. Uh, We went to Subway. And uh, as we were sitting there, like, eating our food, I just looked up at him, and I'm like, Josh, what is going on with you, man? Like, you seem seem a lot happier. Like, why the hell are you so happy? And uh, that's when he introduced me to this thing called minimalism. I thought he was going to tell me that they had put him on Prozac or something. Like, that's really wanted, what I wanted to know. Like, what drugs are you on, man? Um, but no, it wasn't anything like that. It was it was this this uh, practice called minimalism that he started introducing into his life. And he, you know, went from talking about his, you know, experience of kind of uh, jettisoning things over the last several months to make room for life's most important things. He, you know, he then showed me uh, an entire community of people who called themselves uh, minimalists. Um, Josh was describing that community earlier. And, uh, and yeah, I just 
kind of went down that rabbit hole um, as you do on on Google and YouTube. You search one topic and then you're like you know stuck on it for hours and hours. And I you know I didn't see any any uh, one person whose life I wanted to emulate. But what I saw uh, was just a lot of people who w- were very passionate people and they were living meaningful lives and they all attribute it to this thing called minimalism. So I got, I got really excited and I went to Josh. I'm like, all right, man, I'm in. I, I want to do it. I want to be a minimalist. Uh, now what do I do? Cause I, I didn't really know where to start. All I knew is like, I didn't want to spend uh, eight or nine months paring down my items. You know, typical like American got to have it now attitude. I wanted, I wanted fast results. So, uh, that's where Josh and I, we came up with this crazy idea called a packing party where we decided to pack all my belongings. Uh, I had like a, it was a 2000 square foot condo, three bedrooms, uh, two bathrooms, two living rooms. I have no what? idea why I ever, Wait, yeah, this is never, Dayton? yeah, this is in Dayton. I so, have no idea why I ever thought I would need two living that rooms. That would be millions and millions of dollars <laughs> if, if it was New York City. I don't know how the Dayton <laughs> real estate. <laughs> right. It's about a tenth of that cost in, in, in uh, Dayton, Ohio. Okay. But yeah. Two so, living I, rooms. Two huh. living rooms, man. And I had like, and I had it all like furnished and yeah, just like packed to the gourd with stuff. So I literally packed up everything as if I were moving. So Josh came over, helped me pack up my clothes, my kitchenware, my towels, my TVs, my electronics, frame photographs and paintings, my toiletries. I mean, even my furniture. We literally uh, packed up everything and pretended uh, like I was moving. So what I did is over the next three weeks, I unpacked things as I needed it, just day by day. Like I really wanted to to, to get a a sense of what was bringing uh, value to my life. And so you can imagine, like I unpacked my toothbrush, some, some clothes for work. Uh, you know, I unpacked uh, uh, a six pack from the fridge, whatever. Like I, I went day by day, just kind of uh, doing this practice and, and taking notes and writing. And by the end of the three weeks, I had 80% of my stuff still packed up. Hmm. And I just remember like, looking at it all and just thinking, my God, like here is tens of thousands of dollars worth of stuff that I've brought into my life to make me happy. And and it's not doing its job. So, you know, that's where I decided to, to kind of make this change. And, and I donated and I sold all of it. And, uh, that's, you know, when I went to Josh and I'm like, dude, this is a really interesting lifestyle. This packing party is a really interesting experiment. Um, I, I think we could totally start up a website like these other guys and and share our perspective with with our journey into this. And it was kind of like an outlet at first, you know, just something to to kind of jot stuff down and just to put it out there. I guess I, I know too, like when I put stuff out there, it makes me way more accountable. So that was a piece of it too. Um, but yeah, it's that, that's really where the minimalists dot com started. It was with that packing party story. Hi, I'm Lindsey Graham, the host of Wondery's podcast, American Scandal. We bring to life some of the biggest controversies in U.S. history, events that have shaped who we are as a country and that continue to define the American experience. American Scandal tells marquee stories about American politics, like the break-in at the Watergate Hotel, an event that led to the downfall of a president and raised questions about the future of American democracy. We go behind the scenes looking at devastating financial crimes, like the fraud committed at Enron and Bernie Madoff's Ponzi scheme. And we tell stories of complicated public figures like Edward Snowden and Monica Lewinsky, people who found themselves thrust into the spotlight and who spur debates about the future of the country. Follow American Scandal wherever you get your podcasts. You can listen ad-free on the Amazon Music or Wondery app. Academy is a new scripted podcast that follows Ava Richards, a brilliant scholarship student attending Bishop Gray Academy, the country's most exclusive boarding school. Academy takes you into the world of a cutthroat private school where power, money, and sex collide in a game of life and death. Binge all 10 episodes of Academy early and ad-free on Wondery Plus. So did you move to an apartment that had only one living room? (laughs) (laughs) I did. I did. Um, And did you guys quit the job right away, or were you you were still at the telecom retail company and just doing the website, or what, what happened? Yeah, we we were both still in the corporate world for a while. I think it took a while to realize, like once you once you clear that excess, I, it wasn't getting rid of the stuff. That wasn't the the end result. I th- really think that's the 
the first step that that changes everything, right? And, and so, so letting go led me to asking some some deeper questions about my values and, and what do I actually value in my life. And, and uh, eventually, I learned that that there's nothing wrong with having nine to five. I think we all have to pay the bills. But what I was doing in, in that corporate setting. Uh, where I was, it, it didn't align with the person I wanted to be. It wasn't the person who I aspired to be. In fact, the guys who I had aspired to be like as I climbed that corporate ladder, I discovered as I got closer to them that they were kind of miserable. Mm. Like the guys I wanted to be were miserable. Mm. And, and of course, we all, always tell ourselves, like, oh, th- this, I'll be different, right? But if I follow the same recipe, I'm going to get the same result. And so, and, and, and so by. I guess focusing on letting go of my stuff, I started to figure out these things that I thought were important, that I dedicated my life to, they aren't important at all. And so so why am I pursuing the same path? And so, yeah, I, I while I downsized my life, I, I started letting go of those things, but also started letting go of what was most difficult, which was my identity. I, I was so tied up in, into what I did to earn a paycheck as opposed to the the person I wanted to be, as opposed to my relationships that were important to me and, and my health and contributing beyond myself in a meaningful way, I, I realized that I needed to focus on what my values were, not on the this uh, this meme that we've been sold of, of the American dream. Yeah, so ultimately, uh, Josh laid himself off. Um, <laughs> he, uh, you know, his boss went to him and said, hey, we need to save... Uh, we need to save, you know, one and a half million dollars and we need you to come up uh, with a plan to do that. So um, he uh, yeah, he did that and he had to had to write people's names down and had to uh, to lay people off to do this. And when he handed in that list, uh, he put his name at the top of the list. And and uh, it, it was it was about eight months before I left. But it was really inspiring to watch him do this. Um, so what I did, uh, it, it, my boss um he knew about the website. Josh had, Josh had left and, you know, he knew we were, we were friends. So I kind of thought he had an inkling that maybe I would probably take off eventually. And I sat him down at one point and, uh, I'm like, Hey man, uh, I just, I'm just curious. Like if I ever decided to leave here, um, who do you think we would replace my, my job with? Who, Who do you think we would use to fill this spot? And, uh, you know, at that point, I so my job at the time was uh, selling small and medium business sales uh, for 150 retail stores, and I had implemented this program into these stores that was working really efficiently. And he, we were talking about it, and he's like, you know, I don't know if you left if I would fill your spot. Things are going so well. And I'm like, huh, it's a really interesting thought, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> and huh. And then a month later, I... I got sat down, uh, you know, I got, I got a text that said, hey, Ryan, we need you to, to meet me in a uh, room, you know, 812, the, the room that, that I have uh, been to several times across from HR and, and laid off people. in." so I knew it was coming. And uh, yeah, I, I got laid off and and uh, it, it was, so it was about a year, year and a half after, you know, kind of starting that journey where where I uh, left my job. So, uh, Josh, when you left, how did you feed yourself? <laughs> well, I think I think the bad because I mean, there's only so far you can take minimalism. Yeah, well, <laughs> th- th- that's true. <laughs> Unless you're like I... harvesting acorns in the park or something like that. <laughs> now that's minimalist. <laughs> yeah, you, you, you know that. Yeah, I guess there's a fine line there between insanity and minimalism. Um, no, I I when I when I walked away from the corporate world, I didn't I didn't have a a a need anymore to make the sa- I wasn't tied to the same lifestyle I had had previously because. Even though I made really good money in the corporate world, you know, I, I I made a few hundred thousand dollars a year, which in Dayton, Ohio, is is a lot of money, and and I spent even better money though, and so that equation just didn't work. And so, I before I left the corporate world, I, I focused very hard on on paying down massive amounts of debt, hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt, and and. Uh, I also focused on on untethering myself from from expenses. Now I had to pay the bills. I still had to have a roof over my head. My initial plan when I when I walked away from the corporate world, 
uh, people were asking, like, where, do you, where are you going? Who's the competitor you're going to? Uh, because uh, can you take me with you? And, and the answer was there wasn't anywhere I was going. My initial plan was just to be a barista at a local coffee shop and write fiction full time. That's, that's what I wanted to do. I always had a, a passion for, for writing fiction and, and, and literature was just this thing I wanted to do. And um, a few months after that, you know, this, this thing called The Minimalists sort of took off. And and I realized that I, I could still apply that passion, but in this sort of nonfiction capacity. And so, you know, I, Ryan and I wrote uh, a few books together. I started teaching a writing class online and, and doing things that aligned with my values to, to help pay the bills as opposed to to doing something just to earn earn a paycheck and now everything that I do I, it's not like I'm allergic to money I think we all we all want to make an income but but it's no longer the primary driver for doing what I do and, and the best way to 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 be able to say that is to untether myself from from this old lifestyle of having a car payment and having debt and and having these things that that added these sort of creature comforts to my life but also added a, a, a constant low level or honestly a medium level anxiety to my life and and those things are are gone now what little luxury what or big luxury what did you have to let go of that sucked the most man for me it was my uh like really nice toyota avalon i had it was like brand new with <laughs> you know, Bluetooth and sunroof, and it was awesome. Well, you know, that was, I think, so brand new then would have been like a 2010 maybe or 2011. But, uh, you know, now I drive a 2004 Toyota Corolla. So it's it's got, you know, about 230,000 miles on it. It leaks when it rains uh, from the sunroof. So sometimes I look at that, I'm like, man, you know, I really, I really would love to, like, get a new car, one that doesn't leak when it rains. But at the end of the day, the, the cost of that new car, uh, it's not going to bring me an exponential amount of happiness. It's not going to add an exponential amount of value to my life. Because when it leaks, it's not a big deal. Like It's a couple drops. It's not like it's pouring in. Um, the car, is a, it runs really, really well. But yeah, I mean, I do look back and think, man, like having that brand new Avalon was, was really, really awesome. But you know, for me, I just look at it and think at what cost. Yeah, I don't really miss those those things though, Dan. I mean, I, I had two Lexuses, two Le- um, one for you and one for your wife, or you just took one one for me and one for my wife. Okay. Also had a, okay. a, a Land Rover, um, you know, what? just because. And so and, you just like switch, take different cars on different days. Well, yeah, I mean, if you have a three car garage, you have to fill it with something. You, so you took Land this Rover pretty far. I mean, c- commercialism, <laughs> materialism, like you were. Yeah, I mean, consumerism. Yeah, yeah. It, it, I don't think consumption is the problem. I think compulsory consumption is the problem. Or compulsive and, and, consumption. Uh, mm. uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. But but also compulsory in the sense that we we feel like it's what we're supposed to do or it's what we must do in order to achieve some sort of uh, stat- status or, or enlightenment. And, man, advertisements are really good at, at making us believe how inadequate we are, right? And, and I will be adequate as soon as I have that, that car. But once I get the car, then then, well, I need something different or I need something better or, or I need to focus on some other area of my life. And so the void continues to, to widen and, and we try to fill it with more stuff. But, uh, of course, that just uh, fill, that, that widens the, the void even even farther. So, yeah, I mean, I, I had, had a lot of, of stuff. Uh, I'll tell you that I, I don't necessarily miss anything that, that I've gotten rid of, though. It wasn't like there was anything that truly sucked letting go of. Uh, in, in fact, on our, on our podcast, someone, uh, called, we have people call in and ask questions and, and, um, someone said, you know, it, it seems like you guys didn't really get rid of anything important. And, and my answer was, <laughs> well, well, yeah, we, we didn't get rid of anything important. And, and that, that's really, really the point is the things that we thought were important weren't actually important. They weren't adding value to our lives. They weren't serving a purpose or bringing us joy. And so, so the thing is, like, if I get rid of something and I'm depriving myself of it, then I can bring it back into my life. Minimalism isn't about deprivation. It's about living a more meaningful life with, with less stuff, but, but a lot more in, in, in a broader sense, uh, uh, relationships and, and people and creativity and, and passion. So just to pick up the narrative thread here, you said before that uh, not long after you 
uh, laid yourself off uh, and with uh, dreams of being the nef- next F. Scott Fitzgerald or whatever, you, you, um, th- this website, The Minimalists, started to take off. What, what is The mo- Minimalist? What, what, what do you do? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, first I'll tell you, I think, I think what do you do is life's most dangerous question. Uh, b- because, uh, like I said, we ask it all the time, and and broadly, it could mean anything. Well, I, I, I drink water, I write on little yellow notepads, I go to concerts. But really what we're asking is, is generally when we ask that question, I'm not saying you're asking this, but, but as a society, when we, answer, when we ask that question, what we're saying is, where do you work, what's your title, how much money do you earn so I can compare you to me on the socioeconomic ladder? And the reason we don't posit the question that way is because we, we kind of sound like jerks if, if we say it like that. So instead we say, what do you do? And then we spend the next 15, 20 minutes talking about something that we do to earn a paycheck, but doesn't necessarily mean that we're passionate about it or even that interested in. And, and so uh, what do I do? I, I do a lot of things. If, if you're asking, what do we do to to earn a, a living? I mean, we, we, we do a bunch of stuff now. Ryan and I are, are partners in a business. We own a coffee shop in St. Petersburg, Florida. We, uh, I teach a writing class online. We've written three books that thankfully have done fairly well. And hopefully this documentary will do well enough that it'll actually make its money back from, from all the production and promotional costs that we, we put out there. And so we do a lot of things, but everything I do now aligns with the person who I aspire to be. You know, I'm 35 years old now. I'm constantly aspiring to be my, my 40 year old self, you know, looking at that horizon and, and realizing once I get to the horizon, I don't get there. Like there's always a, a, a new horizon. So once I get to 40, I'll be aspiring to be my you know, 41, 45 year old self, or whatever it may be. So wait, let me just you you own a coffee shop. How mm-hmm. how did that start? And I guess you did work as a barista for a minute, but why there there? But you live in Montana, so it, we do. W- w- talk to me about that. <laughs> Sure. Well, uh, we focus on one project a year, typically. And, and so I'll just kind of go back a little bit. In, in 2012, Ryan and I moved from Dayton, Ohio, out to Montana. We started a publishing company uh, so we could publish our own books and also some, uh, some other creative folks' uh, books that we, you know, we look at other people's work and say, I really wish I would have done that. Let me help you along your journey. And so we, we moved out to Montana just because it was really beautiful and it allowed us to, to focus on some creative endeavors, write a book called Everything That Remains. And which was sort of a memoir of the, the last five years of our lives. And in doing so, we didn't want to follow a, a traditional model and wait for a, a publisher and all, all that stuff. So we started our own publishing company, and, uh, and, and we moved out here to do that. And in uh, uh, 2013, um, actually, that was in 2013. In 2014, we, uh, we went on the road. We, did, we basically donated a year of our lives. We went out to 100 different cities in eight different countries, uh, spreading this message of of minimalism and and really focused on and this is what you see in the documentary just so people yeah, know. yeah yeah absolutely so so what you see in the documentary is is that 2014 tour and we we went all over the place and had you know a bunch of events and it kind of started out with you know, two to six people showing up and then eventually as the the message spread hundreds of people started showing up and and uh, it resonated with all different types of people, no matter where they were on the, the socioeconomic ladder. We, uh, we had a former homeless person show up in Adelaide, Australia. We had a factory worker and a CEO show up at the same event in Atlanta. And what I realized is that, that while well, all these people lead considerably different lives, they, they, they're all striving to still live a more meaningful life. And that they're asking the same question, how do I live more deliberately? And it manifests differently, you know, for that CEO, he was trying to figure out why he so he gets so angry when the smallest things happen, like his fourth TV goes out in his second home. Um, whereas the factory worker is trying to figure out, should I buy a new pair of blue jeans or pay my rent? And and so the, these questions, they, they they lead to the same place. And so, But we, we basically donated a year of our lives to get out there and spread this message at, at a whole bunch of free events. Uh, and in 2015, last year, it was uh, we we wanted to focus on a year of contribution. So uh, we, along with our with our audience at, at our website, we we found a different ways to contribute to to different communities. And we we built some wells in, in Malawi. We funded a high school for a year in Kenya. We built an elementary school in uh, Laos uh, for 66 kids there. And and we also met some amazing people in St. Petersburg, Florida, who had this awesome idea to make this community hub that was also a, a really great coffee shop 
And so we had an opportunity to uh, to contribute to that in a different way by becoming business partners in that. And, and so it was it was serendipity that that led us there, but it aligned with what we wanted to do and 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 really set up this this community hub. And I was really familiar with St. Petersburg because that's where where my mother was when when she passed away. So yeah. I, I I had ties in that community already. And then this year, our, our focus has been getting uh, this documentary out into the world. I, I watched your documentary, and, and, and the first voice that comes up is my voice, and I think. Uh, and yeah, it is, and it I is, was yeah. like, I don't know if I'm a minimalist, like, or maybe I'm just sure. a huge hypocrite. Um, because, <laughs> uh, you know, if I look at my desk at home, there's a little glass Buddha that my wife bought me at Barney's. So, uh-huh. um, and we have a kid. And there's just a boatload of – he's a maximalist. I mean, he's got every <laughs> crayon and every color and every toy and every color and just everything. Just the apartment is filled with stuff. I defy you to be a minimalist with a one-and-a-half-year-old. But um, sure. And yet I get that um, letting go, this term you use with reference to physical things, letting go in a much larger sense is – the sine qua non of the Buddhist path of uh, toward enlightenment, whatever, however you want to define that. Um, uh, and obviously, when you die, um, you're going to be letting go of everything. Um, so, I'm trying to figure out. Uh, I don't know if I'm doing a good job of this. Like, am I am I missing something here? Uh, uh, should I be going minimalist? What would that even mean? Uh, so, save me. You want rules, right? You. I wish there was a minimalist rule book. Uh, because we, I'm sure if we could put that, here's a hundred things you should own and you'll be happy because that, A, that'd be easy and, and you could follow up. But of course, the things that add value to my life are, are, are going to be different for you. The but th- I guess I'm not that- I saying, I don't think the, st- I like that little glass Buddha that my wife bought me. Like I, I like uh, well, who, my but, kids' but who says toys. you can't be a minimalist and have that? So, so we're not ascetics, right? No, no, no I get it. I get it. I don't misunderstand what you're saying, but I guess, yeah, I bet I have a lot more stuff than you. And I suspect if I went through it and and with the with my wife and 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 we only kept the things that gave us joy, I'm sure we would lose a lot of stuff. But still, uh, I feel like I, I feel like I'm not overly oppressed by by my stuff, and yet I have a lot of stuff. I think right. Well, well, well the, the soundbite answer is that minimalism is the thing that gets us past the things, so we can focus on life's most important things, which actually aren't things at all. But that doesn't mean that 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 there. Uh, there, there's anything inherently wrong with with stuff. the The problem is the the attachment and the meaning that that we give to those things, and and we get so caught up in what these things mean to us that I think we lose focus on on other stuff. And the the question I would have for you is is do these things actually get in the way, or do they augment your experience of life? And for me, the things that I own now. They augment my experience of life. They they improve it. And I'll do little stoical experiments from time to time. I'm definitely not a stoic, but but uh, you know I'll occasionally temporarily deprive myself of something just to figure out whether or not it's truly adding value to my life. And and I think you don't ever get there though. You don't get to the the thousand things you own and then and then you're happy. I mean, Dan, did you know that the the average American household has three hundred thousand items in it? <laughs> and. and and I probably had more than that. Now, now I was a well organized hoarder, but but all that that you know. So so we, we see this sort of continuum or the spectrum where we think the or, the organized people are on one side, and 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 the hoarders are on the other side. But it's all still one continuum. I I was a well organized hoarder, which means instead of you know being on uh, being a a contestant on on the show hoarders or or a candidate for that show i had all of my stuff in an ordinal system of boxes and and bins stored in my basement but it still looked like a maze of unused stuff that was actually getting in the way and and preventing me from from pursuing a life of of meaning or 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 a life that that i wanted to pursue and so yeah i got rid of 90 percent of my stuff but Let's do the math there. I mean, I probably still have you know twenty or thirty thousand items, whatever that means. I haven't counted my my stuff, uh, although I did once as a parody, and and people took it very seriously. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I, I wrote a, uh, an essay about having two hundred and eighty eight items because I was I was sort of making fun of the people who who do count their stuff, but in, in a, a ribbing, very nice, friendly way. 
Um, because we have friends who, you know, like Colin, who's in the documentary, who has 52 things. Everything he owns fits in his backpack. That's great for him because it allows him to do what he's passionate about, which is travel around the world. He moves to a new country every four months and everything he owns fits in his backpack because he doesn't own a kitchen table because it would be hard for him to carry that onto a plane. I'm sure he also doesn't have a one and a half year old. Uh, Right. (laughs) Same here. And I I have, I have, I have a three year old now and I, I my, my so my life now at 35 looks different from what it did at at 32 or at 28, and so that ideal self is is constantly changing as well. And so as my life changes, I'll bring new things into my life that add value. I'm also I also have to question the things I hold on to because just because something's adding value to my life today, it doesn't mean it will you know, five years from now. And so I have to keep being cognizant of that. Yeah, I didn't mean to sound. Maybe I did, maybe I didn't. I don't know, uh, but I definitely didn't mean to sound uh, defensive about me and my stuff. I, I maybe I'm just naturally kind of minimalist in my tendencies anyway, because I, I don't. If I were to just sort of mentally do an inventory of all of my stuff, I don't. I'm not. I don't have like lots of extra stuff in boxes packed away. Like I only have mm-hmm. the stuff I want to have. Uh, I would yeah, but say you're a Buddhist. And, yeah, and I guess so, that's probably true. I mean, yeah, definitely it, it, it's true that I'm a Buddhist. I don't know that it's, I'm a good Buddhist. <laughs> <laughs> well, well yeah, but we we get people come to us. We were, we were we were on tour in Mississippi. We had you know this young Christian couple come up to us. It's so great to see two guys out here spreading Jesus's message. And, and then we were up in Seattle you know, a few months later, and someone said it's so it's so great to see these guys out here spreading these Buddhist maxims. And we got an email that said, you know, Muhammad was the original minimalist. And, and so what I find is that while this isn't a, a new idea, it is a new reaction to, or it's, a, it's an old idea that's a reaction to a new problem. This, this problem of post-industrial consumerism, which was really, which really skyrocketed you know, starting in, in, in the 90s. We had, we had Juliet Shore, the, the economist um, from Boston, who who's in the documentary and she talks about how you know this this consumerism this unchecked consumerism really started in 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 the 1990s and and we now as as uh, just as a country just as America we have 12 trillion dollars worth of debt i mean it's it's impossible for us to even understand what what 12, 12 trillion dollars means right i mean if you were to spend a, a million dollars Every single day since the birth of the Buddha, you still wouldn't have spent one trillion dollars mm. by now, mm. and we have twelve trillion dollars in consumer debt. Look, and, uh, there's, there's no question. I mean, in my mind, I mean, I, I agree. And I think I probably said this in your movie that that we're constantly on the hunt. We're constantly chasing the next thing that we think is going to do it for us, and obviously that shows up in lots of areas of our life, not just in our buying habits, but in our eating habits and our relationships and in our professional ambitions. And this is the sort of human sickness, right? Um, this is what the Buddha would call suffering, that that we mm. are con- we, we always think, we're always looking for the thing that's just going to do it for us. And there, there isn't such a thing unless, unless mm. you believe in nirvana. Um, that being said, I wonder sometimes as I watch the movie, like, is there a kind of an anti-capitalist vibe to it? And in is do you think there is? No, I, I don't think so. I mean, I think it's it's still the the best system uh, th- that there is. You know, a bad know, system, but the best there that there is, right? Yeah, I mean, isn't, yeah. isn't that what? It, or democracy has been described that way. I think. Yeah, yeah, and I, I think I think capitalism is is similar to that. I mean, the 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 problems with with our society is is not capitalism the problem is us and and the the des- the unchecked desires and and i think marketers do a really good job that there isn't anything inherently wrong with advertising but but there is something sort of inherently wrong with us because we are constantly searching and searching and searching and and so no i don't think it's it's an- anti-capitalist a- at all and in fact it's it's just it's pro intentionality and being intentional with the decisions that that we make each day. We all have resources and money is is just one of them. But we have time and attention and and the people around us, our relationships, our health is a resource, and we have to figure out how we're we're spending these on a daily basis. So if there are people listening who have two living rooms or uh, <laughs> an extra car, just because they needed to fill a three car garage or whatever. If there are people listening who feel like that they that they they are in fact burdened by their stuff and they're interested in exploring 
how they could dip their toe in the minimalist water, what what would you recommend? I mean, obviously your website, but what are the things one could do? Well, if they read all three of our books, they'll be cured, Dan. No, I'm, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> you sound like no, a few uh, of the self-help gurus I know. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I really wish that was the case. Um, you know... For anyone out there who wants to dip their toe in the, into the uh, into minimalism water, um, I'll I'll suggest something that has worked for tens of thousands of our readers. Uh, Josh and I came up with this thing called the Thirty Day Minimalism Game, uh, and it works like this: um, essentially, you find someone who you know wants to declutter as well, whether it's a family member, coworker, friend, whatever. You find someone who wants to do this with you because it's always better when you have support. And plus, like, you know, we all know that decluttering is boring. So when you, you're you in it with someone else, it makes it a little less boring. Actually, decluttering it, isn't that boring. Just, I mean, I, <laughs> don't, I don't like, I I'm not like you. super into organizing the house. I mean, uh, my wife is. and mm. But well, like once in a while, and maybe this is why I don't feel burdened by my stuff, because once in a while she will help me like prune. And I actually find it kind of invigorating uh, getting rid of stuff that I don't need anymore. Yeah, I certainly think uh, that that can you know that could be the case, especially when you get into it and you start to realize all the benefits of like, wow, I can see my floor now, or wow, yes. like I have, yes. I have room. Yeah, I've I, you know I have more room in my house now. Oh wow, for, we uh, we had a fourth cat. I didn't even know that. <laughs> right, man, it had kittens. Right, exactly. So the thirty day minimalism game, like basically, you just find someone who wants to get rid of some stuff, and you both agree to get rid of one thing um, at the beginning of the month on the first of the month. On the second day, you each get rid of two things. And then on the third day, uh, each person gets rid of three things. And it's, so it starts out really, really easy, right? Up until you get to like day 19, you got to get rid of 19 things. And then day 20, you got to get rid of 20 things. It gets a little, a little bit more difficult. So the, the game works uh, like this. Like, you know, whoever, whoever goes the longest wins. Uh, if both people make it to the end of the month, they both kind of win because they have gotten rid of almost 500 items. But that has worked for so many people to kind of dip their toe into it. I can get you that momentum that you need too, right? Because we get overwhelmed and we try to start with the difficult stuff. You know, for me, I actually started with the difficult stuff, and it was it, it made other things easier in time. But it was the hardest thing to do. It was when my mom died. I was trying to get rid of a bunch of these sentimental items, right? And and that's the worst place to start because you have this attachment to so many things. You over time, I realized that the memories aren't in our things. Our memories are are inside us. But we attach all these memories to these things, and, and it's true those things can be triggers for mem- for memories. But but by getting rid of the stuff, I'm not actually getting rid of of the memory. So start with something easy, and I think the minimalism game allows you to do that. Fair enough. Uh, well, you've provoked a lot of thinking on my end. Um, I'm keeping that 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 expensive Buddha my wife bought for me. But um, <laughs> uh, sounds like you really love it, man. I, I, I would do encourage love you to keep it. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, before we go here, we just let's do in a completely unrestrained um, uh, bout of pimping whatever you want to pimp. Like what, what, where, <laughs> d- what are you interested in us doing, buying, seeing, reading of yours? We don't have anything to sell to you, really. If you want to check out the film, you're, you're welcome to do that. It's just called minimalism. But if uh, if the listeners leave here with with one message, I hope it's this: uh, love people and use things because the opposite never works. Okay, there's another edition of the 10% Happier Podcast. If you liked it, please make sure to uh, subscribe, rate us. And uh, if you want to suggest topics we should cover or guests uh, we should bring in, hit me up on Twitter at Dan B. Harris. I also want to thank heartily the people who produce this podcast and really do pretty much all the work. Lauren Efron, Josh Cohan, Sarah Amos, Andrew Kalb, Steve Jones, and the head of ABC News Digital, Dan Silver. Uh, I'll talk to you next Wednesday. Hey, hey, Prime members, you can listen to 10% Happier early and ad-free on Amazon Music. Download the Amazon Music app today. Or you can listen early and ad-free with Wondery Plus in Apple Podcasts. Before you go, do us a solid and tell us all about yourself by completing a short survey at wondery.com slash survey.